Welcome back to the Roost Report and my Life of Gorbachev series. This is what everything has been building up to and here we are. Gorbachev is in his first year of leadership of the Soviet Union. But how will he use his newly granted power? It is March 1985 and in the speediest leadership transition in Soviet history, Mikhail Gorbachev has been installed as the eighth Soviet leader within 24 hours of his predecessor's death. I understood, and many others understood, Vadim Medvedev said, that change was necessary, and this change was connected to the election of a new, young leader. Elected unanimously by the Politburo and the Central Committee, Gorbachev believed that his immediate priority was to appear unthreatening to the geriatric authorities that had succumbed to elect him. We do not need to change our policy. It is a faithful, correct, fully Leninist policy, he assured them, but continued, we need to speed up the tempo, move forward, expose shortcomings and overcome them, and clearly see our radiant future. Chernyenko's funeral gave American leaders their first opportunity to meet Gorbachev, but Reagan wasn't interested in attending. It was his Secretary of State, George Shultz, who convinced him to at least allow his Vice President, George Bush, to hand deliver Gorbachev a letter at Chernyenko's funeral, inviting him to the US. All the better then for Margaret Thatcher, who wasn't one to miss an opportunity. One chauvinistic Foreign Office official had critiqued Thatcher for going uncharacteristically weak at the knees for Gorbachev. She didn't care. No one could have stopped Thatcher going to the funeral little more than three months after her first meeting with Gorbachev. Their scheduled 15-minute meeting lasted an hour. Gorbachev's meeting with Bush and Schultz lasted just half an hour though the latter noted that in Gorbachev we have an entirely different kind of leader than we have experienced before. Gorbachev was a talker. He always spoke more than those he was meeting with, except when he was speaking with his wife. Russians were at first delighted with the new man. He was only in his fifties. He sparkled with energy and humour. He dived cheerfully into crowds. There was widespread relief that the new leader was not elderly and ailing. He encouraged frank and open discussions at Politburo meetings and would stop to talk to civilians on the street. Continue as you've begun, just get close to the people, a woman shouted. I can't get any closer, Gorbachev responded. His first act was to end any potential personality cult surrounding him. He forbade the display of his portrait. For 70 years, Every holiday celebration had featured the members of the Politburo on portraits at the beginning of the procession. No longer. The cult of the leader was ended. Just like that. Ideas were all Gorbachev sought. To the West, Gorbachev was seen as a more moderate and less threatening Soviet leader. Some Western commentators, however, believed this an act to lull Western governments into a false sense of security. His wife was his closest advisor and took on the unofficial role of a first lady by appearing with him in foreign trips. Her public visibility was a breach of standard practice and generated resentment. There are people I know who are interested only in the external side of my life, admitted Raisa in an interview. They even envy me for the clothes I wear and my apparel on formal occasions. But I value something quite different. My participation in the tremendous undertakings that have fallen to the lot of someone closer to me, my husband. Gorbachev was aware that the Politburo could remove him from office and that he could not pursue more radical reform without a majority supporting him. He sought to remove several older members from the Politburo and most of their replacements were from a new generation of well-educated officials who had been frustrated during the Brezhnev era. In his first year, 14 of the 23 heads of department in the Secretariat were replaced. By doing so, 
Gorbachev secured dominance in the Politburo within a year, faster than either Stalin, Khrushchev or Brezhnev had achieved. Within days of becoming General Secretary, he put Ponomaryov, with whom he shared virtually no common intellectual ground, in charge of an array of foreign policy issues in order to undermine Gromyko's foreign affairs monopoly and create an institutionalized challenge to those positions. Once this was achieved, within a year, Ponomaryov was replaced by the previous Soviet ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Dobrynin. Now let's have a look at Gorbachev's other team members, many of whom we have met already. We'll start with other protégés of Andropov's, the Ukrainian Nikolai Richkov and the Siberian Yegor Ligachev. Ligachev was regarded for a time as Gorbachev's second-hand man. As Gorbachev's secretary for ideology, he wanted to continue Andropov's reforms, but was opposed to increasing political freedoms before economic success. Having been noticed by Andropov for his leadership in Novosibirsk and Tomsk, he was instrumental in Gorbachev's election. He would come to have regrets. As for Richkov, he was a capable economic reformer in the Andropov mold. When Gorbachev came to power, he quickly found a way of dismissing another Brezhnev stalwart, Tihonov, to an honorary position. Gorbachev made Richkov a Politburo member, and within a few months, he had officially succeeded Tihonov as chairman of the Council of Ministers. Gorbachev charged him with trying to reinvigorate the Soviet economy through advanced technology and a measure of decentralized planning. Gorbachev had also pacified the veteran Gromyko by appointing him the chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. In theory, Gromyko remained the titular head of the Soviet state until 1988, but actually, the real power was in Gorbachev's hands as General Secretary. Gromyko had been prepared to leave the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because he assumed he could choose his successor. When Gorbachev told him who he had in mind, Gromyko was shocked. He was being replaced with Eduard Shevardnadze, a novice, and not even a Russian novice, but a Georgian, and not even a Georgian novice, but a Georgian who had never worked outside his native Georgia. Gorbachev sidelined Gromyko in the appointment and implied to the Politburo they had chosen him together. Gorbachev's aim was to get a fresh pair of eyes that precisely because of his inexperience had to consider international relations as they really were and not as they had been. International affairs specialist Andrei Grachev, who became Gorbachev's presidential press spokesman, later noted that Gorbachev's choice of Shevardnadze was proof of his determination to recruit a foreign minister who would conduct no policy other than that of the general secretary. Shevardnadze was very willing to do this. The two men had been party bosses of neighboring territories of the Soviet Union, had known each other for many years, and got on well. Gorbachev knew Shevardnadze was against the war in Afghanistan and was for reform. Moreover, Gorbachev was categorically opposed to the appointment of a diplomat. He wanted a politician. In that, he was successful. Jeffrey Howe and George Shultz both wrote that they felt they were talking to a fellow politician, not a bureaucrat. Shevardnadze created a new division on arms control and disarmament and established a formalized conduit to alternative discourses with the creation of an academic consultative council within the ministry. This council institutionalized the participation of experts, such as Yevgeny Primakov and Georgi Arbatov, whose reformist views had been largely ignored until then. Within a year, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had experienced more turnover in personnel than any other Soviet bureaucracy. They brought new thinking and reinforced their focus on West European and American affairs at the expense of the developing world and Eastern Europe. Shevardnadze demanded an unembellished picture of events 
and developed an alternative intelligence network of foreign ministry officials and researchers. Shevardnadze's very non-professionalism helped him take bolder decisions. He would often put his aides off balance. He would give them a paper and then ask, why have we taken this position? All would shrug their shoulders with surprise and say, well, we have always taken it. Shevardnadze would shake his head and reply, that's not an answer. Explain to me the sense of this position. The new foreign minister compelled his colleagues to think in ways that were literally unimaginable to them before. In the same way that Gorbachev found ways to quickly remove Tihonov and Gromyko, so too he found a way to remove Viktor Grishin. You'll remember that Viktor Grishin was the most likely candidate to oppose Gorbachev for the leadership. There was no question that he needed replacing as the first secretary of the Moscow Party Committee. But with whom? It was the conservative Ligachev who recommended a fellow Siberian, Boris Yeltsin, also interested in reform, who had been first secretary of Sverdlovsk. Sverdlovsk, named after a leading Bolshevik who died in the 1919 Spanish flu epidemic, has now been renamed Yekaterinburg again. Yeltsin is the final main character of our series. He was born to ethnic Russians who had lived in this area of the Urals since at least the 18th century. His father beat his wife and children on many occasions and served three years in a gulag labor camp. So Yeltsin was largely raised by his mother, who was a devout Orthodox believer. At school, he was known for his athleticism and for playing pranks. He showed off to his class by playing with a live grenade in front of them. It went off and the thumb and index finger on his left hand were blown off. He was a ladies man and a keen volleyball player and coached the regional girls team during the 1950s. He was a big drinker, which exacerbated his regular tonsillitis and rheumatic fever. Like Gorbachev, he met his future wife, Naina, at university. Though unlike Raisa, Naina stayed out of the political limelight. Yeltsin developed a reputation for confronting alcoholism and punishing absenteeism, and his work on the construction of a textile factory brought him wider recognition. He built residential housing quickly and efficiently, though the award he was promised was rescinded when a five-story building he was constructing collapsed. Joining the party, Yeltsin clung to Yakov Ryabov. They agreed to defend each other, and Ryabov promoted his advance. When Brezhnev promoted Ryabov to a Moscow position, Yeltsin inherited Ryabov's position in Sverdlovsk. Brezhnev met and liked Yeltsin, and in general, Yeltsin looked after his city quite well. Under Yeltsin, Sverdlovsk gained a subway system, the replacement of its barracks housing, new theatres and a circus, the refurbishment of its 1912 opera house, and a youth housing project to build new homes for young families. Where Gorbachev built a reputation in agriculture, Yeltsin's reputation was in construction. In his position, Yeltsin was an ideological conformist. In September 1977, Yeltsin carried out orders to demolish the Ipatiev house, the location where the Romanov family had been killed in 1918, over the government's fears that it was attracting growing foreign and domestic attention. He was also responsible for punishing those living in the province who wrote or published material that the Soviet government considered to be seditious or damaging to the established order. Where Gorbachev read a wide range of authors, including many European Marxists, Yeltsin did not read as much, but enjoyed the works of Russian nationalists like Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was concerned about the decay of the Soviet system and agreed with reforms targeting the general stagnation of society, though he was not concerned particularly with political freedoms. He proved, however, an astute populist. He knew how to use the new medium of television to appeal to the people, a lesson that Gorbachev never really grasped. Yeltsin never liked Gorbachev and Gorbachev didn't realize how much Yeltsin disliked him from the very beginning. 
Yeltsin was a month older than Gorbachev and saw him as controlling and patronizing. Yeltsin had transformed himself into a Moscovite and was very proud of it, whereas Gorbachev was more provincial, more agricultural and did not change his accent to fit in. It was natural that Gorbachev, listening to advice, promoted Yeltsin to the head of the construction department in April, as he was genuinely impressive in this role. But the decision to replace Grishin with Yeltsin that December was fatal, and it would prove ironic that Ligachev was the one to suggest it. Yeltsin was now responsible for managing the Soviet capital city with a population of 8.7 million. We have already met Alexander Yakovlev, who had got to know Gorbachev in Canada. That year, Yakovlev became a senior advisor to Gorbachev, advocating Soviet non-intervention in Eastern Europe and accompanying Gorbachev on his summit meetings. That summer, Yakovlev became head of the propaganda department, where he argued in favor of glasnost, openness, and perestroika, restructuring. Finally, there was Georgi Shaknazarov, the Armenian party intellectual, whose books Gorbachev had read the decade before. Shaknazarov was an aide to Andropov in the 60s and 70s. He spoke with Gorbachev about how party elites like Boris Ponomaryov and Dmitry Ustinov had remained in a state of delusion about the economic conditions of the country, reporting their election excursions to the countryside where all had been made ready for them, as if it were a representative sample of Soviet reality. He would later say about those years, Gorbachev, me, all of us were double thinkers. We had to balance truth and propaganda in our minds all the time, he explained in one interview. It is not something I'm particularly proud of, but that was the way we lived. It was the choice between dissidence and surrender. The truth is the two were more than politicians. They were best friends. Two months after being elected, Gorbachev left Moscow for Leningrad. In June, he traveled to Ukraine, in July to Belarus, and in September to Tumen, urging party members in these areas to take more responsibility for fixing local problems. Gorbachev recurrently employed the term perestroika. Any restructuring of the economic mechanism, Gorbachev said, begins with a restructuring of types of thinking and practice and a clear understanding of the new tasks. The country cannot continue to rely on bureaucrats who take a wait and see attitude or like the Goggle character who organized all kinds of harebrained schemes for all practical purposes, do nothing and change nothing. We and they, he emphasizes, are simply not moving in the same direction. There is no vanguard role for the communists in the abstract. It is expressed in practical deeds. Gorbachev was concerned by the country's low productivity, poor work ethic and inferior quality goods. Like several economists, he feared this would lead to the country becoming a second-rate power. The first stage of Gorbachev's perestroika was uskorenie, acceleration, a term he used regularly in the first two years of his leadership and carried out in practice by Rijkov. The Soviet Union was behind the United States in many areas of production, but Gorbachev claimed that it would accelerate industrial output to match that of the US by the year 2000. The five-year plan of 1985-90 to was targeted to expand machine building by 50-100%. to To boost agricultural productivity, Gorbachev merged five ministries and a state committee into a single entity, Agroprom. However, there would come to be a public perception in the country that many bureaucrats were paying lip service to the reforms while secretly trying to undermine them. Gorbachev's televised walkabouts as he darted around the country listening to ordinary Soviet people's complaints symbolized the change. From the local party secretary to the worker on the factory floor, people were invited to set aside their sloppy habits, roll up their sleeves and get on with the job. The party, the sociologist Tatyana Zaslavskaya wrote, finally recognized the human factor. There was to be a new social contract. 
From the top, the party leadership would ensure that the surplus extracted from Rizhkov's expected productivity gains would go into the much neglected consumer goods sector rather than defence. At the bottom, people would willingly suggest ways of improving work practices. At party conferences and speeches on the anniversary of the October Revolution, Gorbachev invoked Lenin as a supporter of perestroika. Lenin bequeathed to posterity an instructive lesson in the living dialectics of revolutionary thought and action, he said, as many had said before him. But then he continued, all of these things are not simply pages from the Chronicle of the Great Revolution, they are also a constant reminder to us, to those who are living today, of the communists' lofty duty to always be on the cutting edge of events, to be able to make bold decisions, to assume full responsibility for the present and the future. Now, he proclaimed, with all his years of reading Lenin behind him, we are now turning with increasing frequency to Ilyich's last works, to Lenin's ideas of the new economic policy. Naturally, Gorbachev counters, one would not want to equate the NEP exactly with what we are doing at present, when we are in a fundamentally different stage of development. Still, in his view, the time had come to view Soviet history through a prism of missed opportunities. In passing, Gorbachev approvingly mentions Nikolai Buharin, another reformer executed during Stalin's purges. Then, Gorbachev paid homage to Khrushchev's leadership and spoke of its effects on his generation as a wind of change swept through the country and the people took heart, gained new life and became more confident. He complimented Khrushchev's campaign against command bureaucratic methods of management and his emphasis on humanistic ideals and values. Finally, he goes after Stalin, giving an account of his crimes and failures more thorough than Khrushchev before him ever gave. He identifies Stalin as the central villain of Soviet history. All of this was to be expected, but Gorbachev wasn't finished. His next target was Brezhnev. He at first compliments him for stabilizing the Soviet Union and for bringing peace to its citizens for two decades. But then Gorbachev castigates the last years of the Brezhnev era as the source of the current travails. During the latter years of Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev's life and activity, he points out, the search for paths of further progress were greatly impeded by an adherence to habitual formulas and patterns that did not reflect the new realities. As a result, the Soviet economy had been weakened, principles of social justice had been violated, and the country had been thrown into a pre-crisis situation. Now, he concluded, the task is to resolve these problems. Gorbachev's real choice was to either return to the conventions of the Brezhnev years, or to supplement the party's strength with other institutions. He would not, could not do the first, so he had no choice but to do the second. The problem was that if he undermined the party, even a party whose Politburo may soon want to replace him, he would undermine his own leadership position. It was Gorbachev, after all, who was driving the changes. Without him, what would the Soviet Union look like? Looking back at my role in the first stage of the economic reform, he wrote later, I must admit, we unquestionably underestimated the conflicting factors. We laboured too long under the illusion that the problems arose just from the psychological difficulties of party officials. In a May 1985 speech given to the Soviet Foreign Ministry, the first time a Soviet leader had directly addressed his country's diplomats, Gorbachev spoke of another radical restructuring, this time of foreign policy. A major issue facing his leadership was Soviet involvement in the Afghan Civil War, which had then been going on for over five years. Over the course of the war, the Soviet army took heavy casualties and there was much opposition to Soviet involvement among both the public and military. On becoming leader, Gorbachev saw withdrawal from the war as a key priority. He was infuriated 
that not even Politburo members could get basic information about the military-industrial complex. Our military presence in Afghanistan, argued one of Gorbachev's aides, places an enormous financial burden on the USSR, damages our reputation in the Muslim world, and gives the Americans an ideal opportunity to exhaust us. The faster we leave that mousetrap, the better. Pravda, the most prominent Soviet newspaper, received literally a torrent of letters about Afghanistan, another aide recorded. Women are writing, pitying the young men who are dying and suffering mentally there. They are writing that, if this is so necessary, then send volunteers, but not the recruits, because being there and doing what they must do mutilates their souls. In October, Gorbachev met with the Afghan leader, Babrak Karmel, urging him to acknowledge the lack of widespread public support for his government and pursue a power-sharing agreement with the opposition. There is no popular base, Gorbachev admonished Karmel. Without that, any kind of revolution has no chances. The Afghan government must make a sharp turn back to free capitalism, to the Afghani and Islamic values, to sharing power with oppositional and even the currently hostile forces. That month, the Politburo approved Gorbachev's decision to withdraw combat troops from Afghanistan. With or without Karmel, we will follow this line firmly, he declared, which must, in a minimally short amount of time, lead to our withdrawal from Afghanistan. At a Warsaw Pact meeting, Gorbachev told the assembled leaders of Eastern Europe that it was time for them to act independently of Moscow. In a renunciation of the vanguard discourse of the previous 30 years, Gorbachev said that it is time we stopped running fraternal parties like committees. If we disagree with them, then we have to make our point, not just excommunicate them, scheming and meddling in their internal affairs. Interestingly, he also advised them not just to add market mechanisms to their society, but to reorganize the means of state planning. Many of you see the solutions to your problems in resorting to market mechanisms in place of direct planning. Some of you look at the market as a lifesaver for your economies. But, comrades, you should not think about lifesavers, but about the ship. And the ship is socialism. Gorbachev held himself about the Soviet Union, urging managers to adjust their minds to new thoughts. Can't you see that socialism itself is in danger? he would say. Gorbachev also appointed a female party official, Alexandra Biryukova, to the Politburo, while seeking the advice of the female economist and sociologist Tatyana Zaslavskaya. The new leadership pledged to increase social services and authorised the creation of more social science study groups to consider women's problems. They charged the Soviet Women's Committee, who represented the Soviet Union at international women's meetings, to take over leadership of the Gen Sovieti, women's councils originally set up by Khrushchev. There were about 230,000 of these councils, with more than 2.3 million members. Gorbachev's aim was to revive the Genotdal, a section of the party dedicated to women's affairs that had originally been created by Alexandra Kollontai and Inessa Armand in 1919, but shut down by Stalin in 1930. The Filmmakers' Union, the most liberal creative organisation at the time, was the first to support Gorbachev. The Glasnost period became distinguished by the rediscovery of cinematic hidden gems, the censored films, which were officially known for stagnation-era artistic talents. That July, the director Yelum Klimov was allowed to release his anti-war film, Come and See. The film gave a hyper-realistic depiction of a young Belarusian partisan teenager who resists the Nazi occupation of Belarus. Popular on release, it served as a chilling reminder of that victory's terrible costs. Klimov was soon elected as the first secretary of the Union of Filmmakers, where he became a leading spokesman for Gorbachev's policies. Also released in this year was Alexei Gurman's anti-Stalinist film My Friend Ivan Lapshin, which took for its hero a police officer sent to a provisional town on an assignment to wipe out a gang of bandits 
and focused on his romance with an actress in a local theatre. One of Germain's earlier films, Trial on the Road, had sat on the shelves of the Ministry of Culture since 1971. It was finally released the following year. So far, so good. But now, a mistake. Gorbachev's first big mistake. A few months after coming to power, Gorbachev announced his Suhoi Zakon, or Dry Law, to address one of the leading causes of Soviet malaise, alcoholism. In the Soviet Union, alcohol consumption had risen steadily between 1950 and 1985. Like in many other European countries, such as Germany, Ireland, Britain or Lithuania, drunkenness was a major social problem and Andropov had planned a major campaign to limit alcohol consumption. It is important not to generalise. The Soviet Union was huge and in some parts vodka consumption was very high and in some parts it was hardly drunk at all. There had been general prohibition from the First World War to the end of the Russian Civil War ten years later. This was done in most warring countries and involved permitting the selling of alcohol only in restaurants. During the late Brezhnev era, a social contract had arose in which consuming alcohol at work was often tolerated in return for low pay. As a popular joke put it, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. Whereas in other countries where late night drinking culture was seen as the main problem, in the Soviet Union it was in-work drinking. Instead of targeting the source of industrial stagnation, Brezhnev had allowed in-work drinking to increase, leading to a decline in productivity, rising crime and high mortality rates among the male population. Women especially clamoured for something to be done. Encouraged by his wife, Gorbachev, who believed the campaign would improve health and work efficiency, oversaw its implementation. Alcohol production was reduced by around 40%. The legal drinking age rose from 18 to 21. Alcohol prices were increased, stores were banned from selling it before 2 p.m. and tougher penalties were introduced for workplace or public drunkenness and home production of alcohol. Meanwhile, vineyards in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia and Moldova were raised. There were some successes. The All-Union Voluntary Society for the Struggle for Temperance was formed to promote sobriety. It had over 14 million members within three years. As a result, crime rates fell and life expectancy grew slightly between 1986 and 1987. Vodka consumption in 1987 was less than half of what it had been in 1985. However, moonshine production rose considerably and the reform had significant costs to the Soviet economy, resulting in losses of up to $100 billion between 1985 and 1990. If moderate drinkers drank less because of a reluctance to stand in long queues at the reduced number of shops selling alcohol, those at whom the measure was primarily aimed were less easily deterred. Gorbachev later considered the campaign to have been an error, and it was terminated in October 1988. Gorbachev came out of the campaign more popular with women and less popular with men. The prime movers in the Politburo for a major effort to reduce alcohol consumption were Yegor Ligachev and Mikhail Solomentsev. But Gorbachev became associated with the campaign in the minds of most of the public for he supported the principle of a fresh attempt to tackle what he recognised to be a serious social and moral problem. The entire campaign was opposed by Rychkov, who agreed with the State Planning Committee and the Ministry of Trade that such a drive would deprive the state billions of rubles in income. Rychkov's opposition to the campaign was strengthened by his belief that both Gorbachev and Ligachev placed ideology before practical considerations and he instead advocated an alternative, long-term program rather than one designed to have immediate effect. Richkov was proven correct. It was not to be the last time. In his first few months as Soviet leader, 
Gorbachev had meetings in the Kremlin with Fidel Castro, an American congregational delegation led by Speaker Tip O'Neill, former German Chancellor Willy Brandt, and the Italian Prime Minister Bettino Craxi. But the main event of the year was the Geneva Summit in November. Gorbachev and Reagan had agreed to hold a summit in Switzerland. In the build-up to this, Gorbachev sought to improve relations with the US's NATO allies, visiting France in October to meet with President François Mitterrand. In contrast to his trip to Britain the year before, however, he was not given the opportunity to address the French Parliament, and the government responded only lukewarmly to Gorbachev's talk of their sharing a common European home. Gorbachev was particularly disappointed by this, as he had been channeling their former president Charles de Gaulle in vocation of a Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals. Gorbachev did get on well with Mitterrand, but what worried the French in general wasn't that they didn't believe Gorbachev, but that they did believe him. They believed he was serious about giving up nuclear weapons, while France, like the British, were jealously protective of their status as a nuclear military power. Gorbachev promised that for the time being, France and Britain would be excluded from dismemberment talks, and that the focus would just be on the Soviet Union and the United States. This was a substantial concession, though it was not recognised as such. Gorbachev had written to Thatcher in August, seeking her support for the Soviet decision announced earlier that month to impose a unilateral moratorium on all nuclear explosions, and asked her help in getting the US to do the same. Thatcher didn't agree, though she did use the opportunity to encourage Reagan to negotiate on his SDI program, which she, correctly, didn't think was viable. Gorbachev's mistake in making these types of concessions was assuming that other powers wanted nuclear disarmament as much as he did. Indeed, Gorbachev had already made a significant step without asking anything in return. In April, he announced a halt to the further development of Soviet intermediate range SS-20 missiles in Europe. The Reagan administration wasn't impressed by this move, however. They saw it as just a continuation of earlier moves by Andropov. In a perverse way, they were right. Andropov had been willing to negotiate for peace, and Gorbachev was even more willing. Another sign of this occurred when the British managed to extract their spy, Oleg Gordievsky, back to Britain after he had been exposed in the Soviet Union. As Gordievsky arrived, the British government chose that moment to expel from the UK 25 Soviet officials whom they knew to be spies. When this happens, either in the Soviet Union or contemporary Russia, the government always expels the same amount from their ranks, and the Soviet Union did so. When before this would have soured relations, Gorbachev and Thatcher both largely chose to ignore the political hysteria and continue their negotiations. Despite all this evidence in front of them, the Defense Department and the CIA were still encouraging Reagan to be wary of the Soviet leadership. One of Reagan's friends sat him down and told him that because the Russian word for peace was the same as the Russian word for world, it meant that a Russian never really speaks about peace, but only about world conquests. The Soviets always dominated and oppressed their people and continued trying to take over the world, he told him. The various strands of the concept totalitarian, which tied all the anti-Soviet hawks, disabled them from admitting the possibility of real as opposed to cosmetic change in the Soviet Union. While it was therefore apparent to any reasonably well-informed layman that the USSR was on the path to political freedom, many Western policy hawks were detecting ever more cunning stratagems in the Soviet Union's unending campaign for conquest. Gorbachev had sent Reagan a letter in June, making it clear that he was seeking qualitative changes in US-Soviet relations, for to aim simply at containing tensions within certain bounds and trying to make it somehow from one crisis to another was not a prospect worthy of our two powers. 
He wrote that it is the Soviet Union that is surrounded by American military bases, stuffed also by nuclear weapons, not the US by Soviet bases. He urged Reagan to try to look at the situation through our eyes, so that Soviet concerns would become clearer to him. Reagan had written to Gorbachev saying that it was difficult to believe him due to Soviet actions in Afghanistan, even though the American leadership knew that Gorbachev was desperate for the withdrawal of all Soviet troops from Afghanistan. In the run-up to the summit, Gorbachev chose to send another letter to Reagan. In this, he was clearer. He proposed an end to the testing of nuclear weapons, a ban on space weapons, and a 50% reduction of nuclear arms, to be agreed and put into place immediately. Reagan didn't reply for a month and a half, because many in his administration, especially Weinberger and Pearl, wanted Reagan to proceed with his SDI program at full speed. They had been disappointed to find out that Gorbachev really did want disarmament, as they had only agreed to the summit on the assumption that nothing would be agreed. The summit arrived. The Soviet Union sent a large contingent of sophisticated commentators, versed in English and made a good impression. When Reagan and Gorbachev met, the cultural differences between the two countries were exposed. Reagan stood without a hat and coat when he waited for a well-dressed Gorbachev on the cold Geneva day. The American media considered this a win for their more resilient American president, while the Soviet media considered Reagan an idiot for not wearing a coat in the cold. The talks began, and Reagan recounted the long-standing lack of trust bred by the Cold War. As an example of this, he said that in the Second World War, American planes had been denied permission to refuel at Soviet bases after they had bombed targets in Nazi Germany. This wasn't true though it had become a popular lie in post-war historiography in the US. Even more awkward, the Soviet Deputy Foreign Minister Georgi Kornienko had actually been stationed during the war at a Soviet base when American bombers had been allowed in to refuel, and he told this to George Shultz. Shultz, to his credit, accepted the mistake and interrupted the talk to correct Reagan. Reagan then decided to make the point that Thatcher had personally told him to make, that there was a time when the US had nuclear weapons and the Soviet Union did not, but they never made use of that superiority to attack the Soviet Union or to threaten it. On the contrary, he said, we want to live in peace with you. Gorbachev warmed to this, but things became more difficult when Reagan accused the Soviets of intervention and troublemaking in Afghanistan, Cambodia, and Nicaragua. Gorbachev said Reagan was being disingenuous, that he would like to see a settlement in Afghanistan under United Nations auspices, that the US could help in this, but didn't want to. You say, he told Reagan, the USSR should withdraw its troops, but actually, you want them there, and the longer, the better. As for Cambodia, the Soviet Union had supported the communist Vietnamese against the Cambodian regime of Pol Pot, who had been responsible for the deaths of a quarter of his population. Even though the Vietnamese ended the genocide, the Americans wanted revenge for their defeat to Vietnam, so they supported China in its invasion of Vietnam. The Vietnamese occupied Cambodia for 10 more years, while the British Army Special Air Service trained resistance groups. Reagan wanted Gorbachev to end his weapon shipments to the Vietnamese, while playing dumb to any suggestions they were supporting rebels. Finally, there was Nicaragua, which Reagan was particularly obsessed with. The Nicaraguan dictator Anastasio Somoza had been overthrown in 1979 by the Sandinistas who in 1984 had won an election that international observers declared was free and fair. But the Sandinistas were socialists, so Reagan could only imagine that they had been put into power by the Soviets without popular support. So he funded various far-right-wing groups called Contras, 
whose aim was to bring the Sandinistas down through terrorist actions and kidnappings. Reagan was asking Gorbachev to stop supporting the Sandinistas while denying his own involvement with the Contras. We will return to this conflict which would become increasingly important in later videos. The talks now approached Reagan's favourite theme, his love for his SDI project to put weapons in space. Discussions were heated and Gorbachev was initially frustrated that his US counterpart does not seem to hear what I'm trying to say. He's deep in his memos prepared by the advisors, he sighed. He's a real dinosaur. Gorbachev found it difficult to understand that Reagan genuinely believed in this and instead told him that there were a lot of people in both the US and the Soviet Union who had a material interest in the military sector, but that countries like Japan and West Germany had experienced great successes while spending little on their military, so perhaps they should attempt it too. Reagan returned the issue to Nicaragua, saying that if the two sides are to get down to reducing the mountains of weapons, then both must get at the cause of the distrust which has led to them. Gorbachev tried to express to Reagan, over the two days of talks, his complete opposition to Reagan's space weapons project. Reagan tried to make it sound like the peace project he had convinced itself it was, because it had become his pet project, an article of faith. Once the system had been established, he said, he was prepared to share the technology with the Soviets. At that point, they could sit down together and decide if deployment was desirable. Gorbachev laughed at this suggestion and told Reagan that the Americans didn't even share their most advanced technology with the British or the Japanese, so what he had just said should be taken as a joke. Reagan tried to laugh this off. Gorbachev's face flushed with anger. Do you take us for idiots? He shouted. The truth was that half of Reagan's administration actually believed in putting weapons in space, and the other half thought it could be used as a tool in negotiations to get the Soviets to give up something for the equivalent of nothing. Reagan refused to negotiate on SDI, and so Gorbachev's idea to cut 50% in each side's stock of strategic offensive nuclear arms was shelved. Gorbachev was disappointed, but the summit had not been a total disaster. The joint statement at the end included the declaration that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought, and that neither the Soviet Union nor the United States will seek to achieve military superiority. They agreed to accelerate work on arms control and called for early progress on 50% reductions in the nuclear arms of the US and the USSR, and on an interim INF agreement. They signed six bilateral agreements on scientific and cultural exchanges, on the resumption of civil aviation ties, the establishment of consulates in New York and Kiev, and on environmental protection. Reagan called the meeting a fresh start. On returning to Washington, Reagan told Congress that he had gained a better perspective. Many conservatives, however, thought Reagan went soft on Gorbachev when he agreed to hold the summit meetings and sign arms control treaties. Reagan was critiqued excessively in the American press. But Reagan had liked Gorbachev and wanted to convey to others that he wasn't evil. When he met Richard Nixon, he told him that, in his opinion, Gorbachev believed in God. This was a huge compliment in Republican eyes because it meant he was redeemable. Reagan began a post-summit meeting at the White House by saying, Maggie was right, we can do business with this man. I have shown that Reagan was hypocritical and had no understanding of his own belligerence, but Gorbachev made mistakes too. He kept arguing for increased trade between the Soviets and the Americans, and this only gave the impression to the Americans that Gorbachev was desperate. They came to the conclusion that under no circumstances must they increase trade with the Soviets, as their economy was clearly struggling. He also revealed the truth to the Americans that the Soviets were indeed weaker than them. He drew attention to the real capabilities of the Soviet military, expecting Reagan to be more willing to negotiate on SDI. But all he really did was show a weakness the Americans hoped 
to exploit. It is a common theme of the Gorbachev years. Idealistically, he put his cards on the table, showing his hand to his opponent. More than anything, he wanted to be respected. Instead, he was merely liked. The duo's wives also met and spent time together at the summit. They were such different people that they grated on each other immediately. Nancy, as usual, had consulted her astrologer to make sure the summit was held on favourable dates and changed the hotel where she and her husband were staying on the astrologer's request. Nancy wrote that she was nervous about meeting Raisa because she didn't know what to talk about. I needn't have worried. From the moment we met, she talked and talked and talked so much that I couldn't get a word in, edgewise or otherwise. As for Raisa, she picked up where she had left off with Dennis Thatcher and expounded on the flaws of the American political system and recommended a number of works by Marx. Nancy hosted tea one afternoon and recalled that Raisa acted like a woman who expected to be deferred to. Raisa wasn't comfortable in her chair, so she asked for another one. I couldn't believe it, Nancy wrote. I had met first ladies, princesses and queens, but I had never seen anybody act in this way. The next day, Raisa returned the favour and invited Nancy, but Raisa kept stopping to analyse each child's painting that were hung on the walls. What do you think of this one? Raisa would ask Nancy. I felt condescended to, Nancy wrote. Raisa offered Nancy a typical Russian tea, to which she agreed. But when Raisa brought in blinis with caviar, cabbage rolls, blueberry pie, cookies, chocolates, honey and jam, Nancy thought that Raisa was trying to undermine her pride in her super slim figure. If that was an ordinary housewife's tea, Nancy said, then I'm Catherine the Great. It was an ordinary Russian tea. That evening, they all ate dinner together, hosted by Nancy. Raisa told of her husband getting a letter from an 83-year-old woman in a provincial Russian city, expressing approval of the anti-alcohol measures he had adopted and saying she kept Gorbachev's picture next to an icon. The 83-year-old finished her letter by writing her telephone number and that, if Gorbachev did want to call her, he should only do so very early, as she was busy at all other times. Nancy became appalled that it was Raisa that led the conversation, that she wanted to speak about serious matters. A witness recalled that she did not conduct herself as most other wives of heads of state and government did in such meetings, to cross-chat with Mrs. Reagan on palace housewifery and other harmless subjects. When the Gorbachevs left, Nancy said to Reagan, who does that dame think she is? Raisa was just being her normal self, and she didn't realise Nancy didn't like her. Nancy Reagan and I were lucky, she wrote, to be present at the greatest and most important historic meetings between leaders of our two countries. All our feelings, worries and anxieties were just a drop in the ocean of the hope born of these meetings and felt by people throughout the world, the hope of peace and a future for the whole of mankind. Following the conference, Gorbachev travelled to Prague to inform other Warsaw Pact leaders of developments. Reagan sent long letters to Gorbachev late in the year, passionately defending his SDI project, saying that its goal was to eliminate any possibility of a first strike from either side. Gorbachev tried to make Reagan understand how the Americans would feel if the Soviets were making this argument. Only a country that was preparing for a first strike capability needed a space shield, he wrote. If the US proceeded with the implementation of their SDI program, the Soviet Union would be forced to develop further their nuclear forces and increase their capability of neutralizing the threat. It would, as a result, keep both countries in a whirlpool of an ever-increasing arms race. He also accused the US of ignoring the open door that could lead to a settlement in Afghanistan. Any other Soviet leader would have despaired and returned to the status quo. But Gorbachev was an indomitable optimist, and communism is a restless ideology that tends to overthrow itself when it begins to stagnate. 
That is why Gorbachev just couldn't return to the status quo. He couldn't return to how things were. After all, Gorbachev wasn't negotiating because he was trying to get the best deal in a geopolitical tug of war. Nor was he negotiating because he perceived the Soviet Union to be weak. He certainly wasn't negotiating because American military spending had forced him into capitulation. In the 1980s, one third of humanity was ruled by communist governments, and Gorbachev ran a communist party of 19 million members in a country that had no other institutions to show dissent except the ones that Gorbachev himself created. The United States, meanwhile, had suffered their most humiliating military loss to the small country of Vietnam. Throughout South and Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Africa and Central and South America, millions looked with favour on state socialism and Soviet advisers served in Mozambique, Syria and Nicaragua, while proxy Cuban soldiers fought in Angola. If he wanted to, he could light a match and even come out of the fire less scathed. Gorbachev was not negotiating with Reagan and Thatcher because he thought the Soviet Union would lose a war with the West. He was negotiating because he did not want a war with the West. He was negotiating because he believed in the original dream of the revolution that was never meant to be just Russian, that the peoples of the world would put aside the national differences that separated them and live between them in peace. What are we now doing in the Soviet Union? Gorbachev addressed the party. It was a rhetorical question. He didn't wait for them to answer. He told them, we are merging into the common stream of world civilization. To exemplify this, I want to finish this video with the story of Samantha Smith. In November 1982, a 10 year old American girl called Samantha Smith had written to Yuri Andropov. She expressed the views, prejudices and hopes of her generation and it is worth quoting the letter in full. My name is Samantha Smith. I am 10 years old. Congratulations on your new job. I have been worrying about Russia and the United States getting into a nuclear war. Are you going to vote to have a war or not? If you aren't, please tell me how you are going to help to not have a war. This question you do not have to answer, but I would like it if you would. Why do you want to conquer the world, or at least our country? God made the world for us to share and take care of, not to fight over or have one group of people own it all. Please, let's do what he wanted and have everybody be happy too, she wrote. The letter was published in the Soviet press and Andropov decided to personally reply. Andropov's letter reflected the views, prejudices and hopes of the reformist generation. And for the same reason, his reply is worth quoting in full. Dear Samantha, I received your letter, which is like many others that have reached me recently from your country and from other countries around the world. It seems to me, I can tell by your letter, that you are a courageous and honest girl, resembling Becky, the friend of Tom Sawyer, in the famous book of your compatriot, Mark Twain. This book is well known and loved in our country by all boys and girls. You write that you are anxious about whether there will be a nuclear war between our two countries. And you ask, are we doing anything so that war will not break out? Your question is the most important of those that every thinking man can pose. I will reply to you seriously and honestly. Yes, Samantha, we in the Soviet Union are trying to do everything so that there will not be war on Earth. This is what every Soviet man wants. This is what the great founder of our state, Vladimir Lenin, taught us. Soviet people well know what a terrible thing war is. 42 years ago, Nazi Germany, which strove for supremacy over the whole world, attacked our country, burned and destroyed many thousands of our towns and villages, killed millions of Soviet men, women and children. In that war, which ended with our victory, we were in alliance with the United States. Together, we fought for the liberation of many people from the Nazi invaders. I hope that you know about this from your history lessons in school. 
And today we want very much to live in peace, to trade and cooperate with all our neighbours on this earth, with those far away and those nearby, and certainly with such a great country as the United States of America. In America and in our country there are nuclear weapons, terrible weapons that can kill millions of people in an instant, but we do not want them to be ever used. That's precisely why the Soviet Union solemnly declared throughout the entire world that never will it use nuclear weapons first against any country. In general, we propose to discontinue further production of them and to proceed to the abolition of all the stockpiles on Earth. It seems to me that this is a sufficient answer to your second question. Why do you want to wage war against the whole world, or at least the United States? We want nothing of the kind. No one in our country, neither workers, peasants, writers, nor doctors, neither grown-ups, nor children, nor members of the government, want either a big or a little war. We want peace. There is something that we are occupied with, growing wheat, building and inventing, writing books, and flying into space. We want peace for ourselves and for all peoples of the planet, for our children and for you, Samantha. I invite you, if your parents will let you, to come to our country, the best time being this summer. You will find out about our country, meet with your contemporaries, visit an international children's camp, Artyk, on the sea, and see for yourself. In the Soviet Union, everyone is for peace and friendship among peoples. Thank you for your letter. I wish you all the best in your young life. Yuri Andropov. On July the 7th, 1983, Samantha Smith flew to Moscow with her parents and spent two weeks as Andropov's guest. During the trip, she visited Moscow and Leningrad and spent time in the Soviet pioneer camp in Artek in the Crimea. Smith said that she and her parents were amazed by the friendliness of the people and by the presence many people made for them. Speaking at a Moscow press conference, she declared that the Russians were just like us. In Artek, Smith chose to stay with the Soviet children rather than accept the privileged accommodations offered to her. For ease of communication, teachers and children who spoke fluent English were chosen to stay in the building where she was lodged. Smith shared a dormitory with nine other girls and spent her time there swimming, talking and learning Russian songs and dances. The American press critiqued Andropov for not visiting Smith. Actually, he had fallen seriously ill. Nevertheless, Andropov and Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman to orbit the Earth, spoke to Samantha over the phone. The Soviet media followed her every step. They adored her. But in the United States, the event drew suspicion, and some regarded it as a public relations stunt. Those who thought it was a positive step for peace were outshouted by those saying it was just an example of how brainwashed Russians were. When Smith returned to the US, many critiqued her as an instrument of Soviet propaganda. Smith continued to be an impressive activist for peace causes, especially in Japan, and some Soviet children visited the US in return. But tragically, on August the 25th, 1985, the plane that Smith was traveling on crashed and everyone on it died. It was officially ruled an accident. People all across the Soviet Union were distraught by her death where she was eulogized as a champion of peace. A monument to her was built in Moscow. Samantha Smith Alley in the Artek Young Pioneer Camp where she had gone was named after her. A commemorative stamp was issued with her likeness and Soviet astronomer Ludmila Chernik named the asteroid she discovered after her. A diamond found in Siberia, a Soviet mountain, a cultivar of tulips and of dahlias, and an ocean vessel were all renamed in Smith's honor on both initiatives led by Gorbachev and popular initiatives by Soviet peoples. At Samantha Smith's funeral in Maine, Reagan sent a message of condolences to her mother. But before it was read, the Soviet ambassador, Vladimir Kulagin, stepped up to read a personal message. It was, of course, from the leader 
of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. Everyone in the Soviet Union who has known Samantha Smith will forever remember the image of the American girl who, like millions of Soviet young men and women, dreamt about peace and about friendship between the peoples of the United States and the Soviet Union. In the next video, we're moving on to 1986, the busiest year in Gorbachev's life. Will Gorbachev be able to enact the changes he hopes for, or will he be swept up in events beyond his control? If you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. Like, comment and subscribe. See you next time.